Okay. Well, hello and welcome everybody. Um, so this, this lecture um, is the first in a year long conversation titled Oceanic Imaginations, Fluid Histories and Mobile Cultures, um, which is run by my colleague Deba Sri Mukherjee and I. Um, the project is sponsored by the Institute of Religion, Culture and Public Life at Columbia University. We're thrilled today um, to welcome Pamela Gupta, who is professor at, um, is it Weiser? Uh, Weiser, yeah. We, it's a bit confusing because the Weiser, you pronounce the W, but the Witzbader is Randy Bell. So. Right. so it's uh, Weiser, which is the Witz Institute for Social and Economic Research at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, and she holds a PhD in sociocultural anthropology from Columbia. And broadly speaking, her research explores Lusophone postcolonial links and legacies in India and Africa. Uh, Professor Gupta has published in many prominent journals, um, particularly recently co-editing thematic special issues for feminist theory, radical history review, and critical arts. Um, she's co-edited a book whose essays I've taught in my Indian Ocean course, um, called Eyes Across the Water, Navigating the Indian Ocean with Isabel Hoffmeyer and Michael Pearson. Uh, but her first um, kind of sole monograph is called The Relic State, um, St. Francis Xavier and the Politics of Ritual in Portuguese India. Um, and her most recent book um, is called Portuguese Decolonization in the Indian Ocean World. Um, and this collection of essays broadly um, provides a nuanced understanding of Lusophone decolonization in Goa and Southern Africa, according to the perspectives of people who experienced it. It moves beyond linear histories of colonial independence, offering a productive and new approach to writing post-national histories and ethnographies by using lyrical prose and ethnographic observation and demonstrating the value of using different source materials uh, to access narratives um, of decolonization, such as photography. Um, and fittingly, uh, today she will present new work on a Zanzibari photo studio um, through a reading of images uh, according to the trope of darkness. So the title of her talk is of sky, water, and skin, uh, photographs from a Zanzibari darkroom. And I just want to say, um, after the Q&A is over, um, we will ask you, or sorry, after the talk is over, we're gonna run the Q&A by um, asking you to use the raise hand function to ask a question, at which point you'll be sort of um, your video will be kind of brought online um, with the panelists and you'll be able to ask your own question. Um, so join me in welcoming Professor Pamela Gupta. All right. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Mana and Debashri and Mariana for organizing this talk and for inviting me to give this lecture today. So I'm looking forward to this. Um, okay, I'm going to speak for about 40, 43 minutes or so, something like around the, that range, um, and I'm going to show some images. So let me just see if I can share my screen with you guys. Um, share. Okay, and let me do a slideshow. Okay, just give me a check to tell me if that's working. Yeah? Yes. Okay, great. I'm going to start then. Okay. Uh, introduction. Darkness. So time dismembers the images of our time, or to put it in an archeological way, it is as if the details of our lives have accumulated in layers. And now some layers have been displaced by the friction of other events and bits of contingent pieces still remain accidentally tumbled about. And that's a passage from Abdul Razak Gurna uh, from his novel, By the Sea. Capital Art Studio is the last remaining photography of studio in Stonetown, Zanzibar, and the subject of a larger joint research project with a colleague of mine, Meg Samuelson, who is a literary scholar who used to be based at the University of Cape Town and is now at the University of Adelaide. So we've been doing the research together, but then we've been writing our own pieces. So this piece comes out of that project. And eventually we're hoping a, a book, a co-authored book will, will be the final product. So um, it's been a really sort of fun collaborative project to do research with a scholar of a different discipline and sort of write about it and our very different approaches. Okay. So the idea for approaching this visual archive through the trope of darkness came out of a conference I attended in January, 2019 on the theme of literary and cultural darkness that was held in Svalbard, Norway over five days of atmospheric darkness. Interestingly, it was several concepts from the call for papers for this conference that shaped my initial thinking. The appeal of darkness as a place of and for meditation on the visual, 
a symbol of colonial otherness, an aesthetic choice and thing of beauty. The idea of environmental darkness from light pollution, and finally darkness is a central motif and a precondition for creativity. Equally significant was the affect of rare natural darkness itself, the humbling majesty of the polar night that I experienced on this Arctic island and that led me to develop this paper presentation in unexpected directions. So here I'm interested in reading an older visual archive anew to ask difficult questions around photography's continuities, metamorphoses, temporalities, and spatialities, and histories remembering, forgetting, and finally suppression, all tied to politics and aesthetics. Approached in this manner, the theme of darkness becomes a fitting way to enter into the Capital Art Studio collection, uh, hereafter Cass, as a way to understand the role of a father and son proprietor team that spans 90 years as African image makers who experienced Zanzibar's island history from its heyday as a cosmopolitan Indian Ocean port city through to its period of revolution integration with the Af African mainland and then its current position on the global tourist island circuit. It is a way of refracting Zanzibar's accumulated layers of history through its extant images, dismembered by time, but still that which remains by chance or accident, a point gesture to in my opening quote by Zanzibari novelist Abdul Razak Gurna. As well, such a framing is attuned to the time and space of photography's work, both its potentials and limits. That is when, where, and how certain images were produced by Oza at his physical studio, including moments of political flourishing and those of disruption. It is also about the processes by which his son Rohit re-narrativizes certain images and experiences, forgetting some, emphasizing others over time, including my conversations with, with him over three visits to Stonetown in 2012, 2015, and 2018. Lastly, the work of photography involves my own anachronistic activation of a selection of Oza images during a very different time and space that transcends the boundaries and borders of both nationalism and historiography of Zanzibar itself. It is a curatorial experiment attuned to the theme of island darkness and is generative of other ones of collecting, preserving, creating dialogue between images that have survived the vicissitudes of time, history, and memory and is centered on the other lives of images following the work of George D. Huberman. It has been an attempt on my part to open to them to a different set of performances, meanings, framings, watery reflections, and lived experiences that have the potential to help us think anew about African history and aesthetics, photography, and islands. Part one, experiments of the dark. Taking Joseph Conrad's 1899 figuration of Africa as a starting point, uh, sorry, figuration of Africa as the heart of darkness as a starting point. I open up this presentation with a reminder of the ways in which the discursive darkness of Africa has rendered it generalized, unseen, invisible, undefined. It is here that the role of visual can perhaps play a crucial role in moving it out from under the cover, secrecy, and negative connotation of darkness. Here, I want to reconceptualize Zanzibar instead as the heart of lightness, bringing it, and specifically a visual collection, to light and with the potential for a new set of readings. It is a form of photographic exposure over a longer, long durée, an attempt to take a mid 20th century African photography collection out of what Patricia Hayes calls, quote, the dark rooms of history that are typically tied up with colonial logics and archives. Instead, I'm moving this visual collection into the distinct light and lighting of the early 21st century and I'm mooring this island from its Omani Sultanate and British protectorate hold and giving it breath and weight once again. In order to hone in on a certain material, certain material and metaphoric aspects of darkness is saying something else about capital art studio, photography, and Zanzibar. Michelle Wright develops the idea of the physics of blackness, looking for what she calls specific space times when and where it blackness is being imagined, defined, and performed, and in what locations, both literal and figurative. Here I hope to push thinking about the physics of darkness in the same complex ways. Doing so implicates a relationship between tropes of blackness and darkness in and for Zanzibar. What happens then when we return to the etymology of the word to consider dark as the absence of light and black as a realization of that absence? Is blackness then how we experience darkness? Does this become a possible methodology for how to read this historical photographic collection to create other lives for those African subjects and objects found or located in a set of older images? It is a form of experimentation of the dark. Uh, part two, experiments in the dark. Capital Art Studio, its name still evokes the grandeur and worldliness of Zanzibar itself. Ranchard Oza, newly married, had arrived from Gujarat, sorry, had arrived in Gujarat in 1925 via Zanzibar's imperial connections with British India. It had taken his parents 28 days on a dow to cross the Indian Ocean, Rohit tells me during my first visit with him in 2012. 
His father, already an avid photographer prior to his departure, discovered a vibrant community of going photographers running successful studios, a topic I've written about elsewhere. After apprenticing with AC Gomez and Sons for five years, and that was from 25 to 1930, Ronshad opened his own studio and made a life for himself as a photographer, husband, and father. He would hang out with a gang of photographers, staying up until midnight to felt prints in his very own darkroom, details that Rohit finally remembers from his childhood and recounts for me on different occasions. His father would buy paper and fixer from a local Goan photographer and have his postcards printed in the UK and Germany, which he then sold in packets of 12. Rancho would produce Christmas and Eid cards as well, which were on display in the front studio. Rohe tells me how his father was talented, an extremely skilled photographer who knew all the aperture shutter speeds and timings for processing film, both black and white in color. His father was also a fervent filmmaker who owned a Super 8 camera, producing home movies of family events alongside shorts of the Zanzibar Royal Navy, his special interest. Ronshad invested in several backdrops by mail order from the UK in 1940. That is right when his business started to stabilize. One of these backdrops was of a nondescript seaside with, with featured palm trees. Another was, which I show here, was a balustrades with a view onto a lake, which is still on display, albeit a bit faded now in the back part of the studio. The backdrop abuts a faded and worn black and white checkered flooring pattern that suggests all the feet that stood there, poised to have their photograph taken. It is a cherished moment of grace in the words of Liam Buckley. Rohit tells me how his father liked to let scenes unfold, take natural photographs, even as he experimented with double exposures and superimpositions later in life. It was, Ra Rash it was Ron Shad who also trained Rohit in darkroom developing and printing when he showed an interest in following his father's profession at a young age. Here I imagine Rancha and Rohith, father and son, working together, forging a bond over the love of photography in the darkroom, and which is purposely blackened from a bright sun cast from the island light in space at Zanzibar. In this section, I focus on the physical darkroom of Capital Art Studio that was historically located in the back of the studio on Kenyatta Road in Stonetown. Even as that darkroom is no longer exists today, there's a blue curtain visible from the front that reminds oneself of what was once there. It was a place that had a history and life of its own separate from the front, one where photographs of a range of Zanzibari persons and places were developed, printed, and came into material existence on paper. Here I've developed the darkroom as a place of photographic complexity and not just mechanical reproduction, following the work of Candace Jensen um, and her recent work on South African, what she calls darkroom girls. As she rightly points out, the darkroom as a material space for the production of photographs is largely forgotten in the larger histories of photography. What visual images then get left out with their almost exclusive focus on the photographer in the final print, as opposed to the technician? It was he, she, or they who often make crucial decisions to develop a certain roll of film, shade or darken certain areas, or persons within the edges of the photograph, or produce a particular print. As well, if we zoom in on a particular African darkroom, such as Ozo's here, wherein he happened to be both the technician and the photographer, we realize that each has its own photographic assemblage that returns to the history of photography and its foundational basis and concepts of dark absorption and light reflection in the service of image making. In other words, it's important to expand our thinking of, photographic darkroom, of a photographic darkroom beyond its physical space to be a place or rather site of crossings where specific images happened and are made to happen and with Zanzibar made representable as an island space through the medium of photography. The darkroom becomes a site for analysis and interpretation on its own, replacing the front rooms of history and photography then. It's a site where important decisions were made involving printing, developing, cropping, editing, formatting, and production. Can we also think of the chemical and watery processes of printmaking within the darkroom, working as a palimpsest to expose the layers of images, and as paralleling, in some sense, Sansevar's island relationship to a surrounding Indian Ocean? Does one stand in for or blur the other, a form or the other, a form of thinking, seeing, and developing images through relationality on the part of Oza, as akin to the way he envisioned and experienced living in Stonetown and on the island of Zanzibar. <laughs> Lastly, the photographic darkroom can be thought of as a sensorium filled space of talking and touching, secretions, liquid substances, and smells, all taking place in the dark, must be remembered. For the case of Cass, it was a space where a father and a son worked side by side in developing both prints and their relationship with one another. Here we might expose the darkroom to be a site of sociality and kid networks of technological development and reproducibility as well. Lastly, the photographic darkroom can be perceived as a political and politicizing space. By bringing it into sharper focus, it becomes an agentive space of history making. 
a testament to which versions of history, including which subjects, objects, and ideas will be given material existence in some sense, and will come to be visualized for a future moment. Just as a photographic print then reverses the dark and light filled sections of a negative, there's a flipping here from the front to the back to the objectness and subjectness of the darkroom. Can we push these, uh, these ideas even further potentially to think about fieldwork, including my research visits to Zanzibar, my own photographic practices, and the backstories narrated to me by Rupa Doza of his father as a sort of darkroom to my ethnographic reflections cohered here. This second section is an experiment in the dark. Okay, part three, beauty in and of the dark sky and water. Zanzibar was historically situated as a nexus point for East African, Indian Ocean, Mediterranean, Persian, Arab, and Atlantic trade networks. Goods, people, and ideas circulated within this globalized space and regional island hub. Zanzibar being a frequent stopping off point involving different sets of rulers, first the Portuguese, then the Omani Arabs alongside the British, who then made Zanzibar protectorate and part of their colony of Tanganyika until the latter's independence in 1961. Jeremy Prestold emphasizes Zanzibar's historic unusual cultural vibrancy, stating that, quote, relatively few ports in the world have commanded an unrivaled relationship with such a vast hinterland as Zanzibar in the 19th century. The island capital functioned as an intermediary between the greater East African region, stretching from Lake Malawi to the Eastern Congo and Southern Somalia, and ports as distant as Boston, Istanbul, Calcutta, and Canton, end quote. In this third section, I developed the trope of darkness as a form of beauty visualized in certain images of sky, water, and skin from this island photographic archive. Here, darkness is an aesthetic, a hue, a mood, and affect. The first set of photographs of sky and water have called from the collection enable a viewpoint of Zanzibar's historical position as a port city and do so through a framing lens of darkness and lightness. My focus is on the final print, even as I'm aware of Ozo's darkroom techniques that make possible the collection in the first place. There exist numerous images of a luminous Indian Ocean, one where sky and water constantly spit the photograph, reflecting off one another and incoming light of depth, breath, and difference, including framing Zanzibari carved wooden doors and cumulus clouds wafting in a patterned mansonal sky. Just as islands are surrounded by water and are constantly floated by light from all sides, they are also highly photographable for these same reasons. Ranchard Ozo was a skilled photographer who took advantage of both photography's elemental traits and sounds of islandness, as well as the fact that ocean and sky are both mediums that reflect light powerfully to produce images of Zanzibar's palm trees, sunsets, and cliffs, including their watery reflections. The darkness of the water surrounding the island is set up in contrast to the lightness of the sky. Sorry, I'm going to go back to this one. In many of these images, these then these images of sky and water also showcase the famous Dao of Zanzibar and gesture to these specialty boats and cultural symbol that are dependent on the winds, cross currents, and clouds to circulate people and things, bringing slaves, spices, and ivory from Africa to Europe, with its white lateen canvas sail suggesting a lightness of being, of travel, worldliness, and mobility in an earlier era. At the same time, the stuff of these dows implicate darkness, the ripples of waves they produce as they cut through dark, choppy waters, suggesting Zanzibar's longer history of slavery, slavery that was abolished by the British in 1876, but then remained legal in Zanzibar until 1897. There was a busy traffic in black bodies that crossed or drowned, some meeting their watery submerged futures in the act of arriving in this port city via the Indian Ocean, or what was also called Kalapani, or the Black Waters. Ranshad went also created iconic images of Zanzibar's islandness for tourist consumption, relying on the Dow to do so. Included in here is one such photograph produced in the 1950s, and this is the one I'm showing now, where Ranshad superimposed a Dow onto the empty waters of the Indian Ocean, perfectly framed by the famed 16th century Portuguese arch in Stonetown, built to mark their early presence and control of the island. Probing deeper then for the multiple lives embedded in the set of images of sky and water from the cast collection highlights Zanzibar's idliness, its sense of placeness in, flourishing 20, in a flourishing 20th century Indian Ocean world. Its position is the stopping off point for sailors, traders, merchants, members of the Imani Sultan's royal family, and British colonial officials, in its complicit history in the global trade of slaves, and finally its stark monsoonal beauty. Perhaps these photographs of sky and water produced by Ranshad of an island and taken on an island during a particular historical time frame, and his sort of busy period is roughly between the 30s and 60s, can be pushed even further to say something more about photography representing Zanzibar's Indian Ocean islandness. 
uh, reading offered from this contemporary early 21st century moment of a global pandemic that has restricted, if not completely stopped, all travel and tourism to such idyllic islands as Zanzibar. And finally, an ongoing anthropocentric crisis of climate change that will only worsen with time. Okay, part four, beauty in and of the dark skin. Next, I focus on a set of photographic prints from the cast collection that showcase the beauty of black skin and which differentiate varying shades of darkness as opposed to the dull grayness of human skin. Here, it's important to conceptualize darkness as both, quote, an aesthetic as well as a social concept that operates in visual tension with each other. And that's from um, John Pepper. Uh, in other words, darkness in relation to skin lends itself to multiple simultaneous readings as always involving categories and value judgments on race. It is potentially a thing of beauty or ugliness and can easily go either way for the viewer. Again, my focus is on the material photograph, but I'm still interested in keeping in mind the certain darkening technologies of lighting, setting of exposure time, zooming, that were employed by Ron Shah to differentiate a range of skin tones in these photographs, and, and, and and against across a range of bright, bright daytime and dark nighttime settings, which showcase Zanzibar's twined British protectorate and Omani Sultanate status. Oza was well trained in dark room processes and technologies, as is evidenced in his many acts of portraiture. If we think of portraits as light based images, then we are perhaps made more aware of the photographic techniques he employed both outside and inside the dark room to signal the beauty of darkness. They include heightening the black or black skin, giving light to dark faces, and highlighting textures, creases, and folds. This set of portraits is quite remarkable in my mind as they represent the reality of a cosmopolitan Zanzibar including a range of figures and personalities that passed through this thriving port city engaged in trade or business from the 30s to the 60s prior to its revolution. Certain portraits made by Oza of a range of Zanzibari's figures stand out. This is some of the ones I'm showing here. The young boy with a taut smile and intent gaze, the bright billowing folds of an Omani sailor's kaftan, the wrinkled skin and curvaceous mustache on a weathered Pakistani Baluchi sailor, an aged Sultan Khalifa wearing his royalty with a faded pride, a lively crowd of people, including men, women, and children, watching a Dow race off camera, and finally a casual street stream with all manners of people, age, and dress. Crossing paths. Oza illuminates a range of skin tones in these photographs of Africans, Asians, and Arabs, while at the same time showing the complexity of facial features that enable viewers such as myself to move beyond the blankness of race to visualize Zanzibaris as islander individuals. In the act of reading Ranchad's images of dark skin for their other lives in the here and now and during this context of Black Lives Matter, I'm invested in reading them for indexing a larger global history of the photography of black skins and bodies, starting with the psychoanalytics of inhabiting blackness from Franz Fanon in 1952. I'm reminded of Robert Maplethorpe's censored photographs of the 1980s that I witnessed that transformed black skin into marble sculptures. Here, however, we must also reckon with Kobina Morsher's argument that Maplethorpe's ability to photograph black bodies as if they were marble or bronze sculptures also continued a centuries-long tradition of separating black physicality from black subjectivity. Morsher's point returns us in some sense to Michelle Wright's work gestured to earlier on the physics of blackness, wherein instantiations of blackness constantly need to be situated in specific time, place, context. Closer to home, I'm reminded of South African photographer Zanelli Mahole's recent set of self-portraits, Sonyama Ningama, or Hail the Dark Lioness, that was printed in 2018, that show the luminosity of her own black skin. Can we consider the imaging of these kinds of photographs of black bodies and skin, including then from Oza down to Mahole, a form of visual activism? Finally, I read the set of images through the lens of Krista Thompson's writings on photography on and of the tropics of the Caribbean, which could be likened to the tropics of Zanzibar as an island nation of intense heat, humidity, beauty, light, darkness, and bodily earthy sweat. Thompson writes of the sheen and shine of black skin aesthetics and the role of specialty lighting and showing off the beauty of blackness through photography. A detail and skill perhaps not lost on Ron Shah even as he was working in an East African context in an earlier historical moment and thus more reliant on natural lighting, but to similar effect and affect. Returning to our theme then of the other lives of photographs, these images of a range of dark skin tones produced by Oza of a diverse island population, once again point to the role of photography or as for filling in Zanzibar's interstitial islandness. Okay, part five. A time of photographic darkness. Um, Mana, can you just tell me how I am on time? Yeah, okay. Uh, a time of photographic darkness. 
Several years into establishing Capital Art Studio in Stonetown, Ranshad became the official photographer for Omani Sultan Khalifa bin Harub, a relationship that continued with his family members after the latter's death in 1960 and until the Sultanate was deposed in the revolution of January 1964, a momentous event for the people in history of Zanzibar. Ranshad had taken all of the Sultan's official photographs over a 30 year span, including of royal events, family portraits, etc. With the revolution, the unification of the Zanzibar Islands of Nguja, which includes Stonetown, Pemba, and Tumbatu, alongside mainline independent Tanganyika, took place, together becoming the nation state of Tanzania. So, in this last section, I conceptualize the Zanzibar Revolution of 64 excuse me, as a time of photographic darkness. Here darkness is a temporality, climate, mood, political moment, and ideology, a form of restricting visuality in terms of the photographic. And here I don't really talk about the filmic, but that's, that's something else that was, was interestingly happening at the same time. For many of Zanzibari Islanders, including its Goan, Parsi, uh, its most famous resident, of course, is Freddie Mercury, and Gujarati, including the Oza family, minority communities, who continued to then look outwards to the Indian Ocean, they did not support the revolution. For them, it was considered akin to a time of political darkness, one of chaos, killing, secrecies, and sudden forced departures of Arabs and Indians, certain lesser known aspects of a revolution that have recently come to light. And I'm referring here to the work of William Bissell and Maria Fourier Ray, who've written about this. Interestingly, the revolution itself was started in the dark of night of January 11th to 12th. 1964, a detail that is important to the layered story of darkness I'm telling here. For Ran Shah, the time of the revolution was initially one of personal hardship, a shifting political climate, but also one of slow acceptance to historical change. All photography studios of Stonetown viewed by the new government in support of the Sultan were immediately shut down in the days following the revolution. Rohit tells me that his father was first forced to remove the portrait of Khalifa holding pride of place in the studio wall, a difficult thing to do considering that the Omani leader husband and father had become his close friend through their photographic relationship. Rohit has a distinct memory of his father during these times. It is of him burning all the images, the sultanate images, both prints and negatives, in sight inside the studio, a 14-year-old son quietly watching from the sidelines. Despite all these strict measures, Ranshad astutely managed the political transition post-revolution, keeping his photography studio open while the last two remaining ones closed shop including that of his mentor, Goan photographer, A.C. Goman. According to Rohit, his father was forward thinking and from this moment onward, got involved in taking photographs and documenting Afro Shirazi party rallies, visiting socialist dignitaries to Zanzibar from Africa, the Eastern Bloc, including the former GDR in China, and every day, and also documenting everyday life in the changing stone town. Ranchard was even able to put up his own portrait of the new nationalist leader, Abed Karume, to replace that of Khalifa that had been forced to remove. Zanzibar thus experienced a time of visual darkness in that photography practices were temporarily restricted under the new Afro Shirazi political party. As public photography had been officially banned, many chose the cover of darkness to take photographs, including John De Silva, a Goan Zanzibari photographer whom I met in 2012 in Stonetown. He recounted his own, his own story as a young man at the time of the revolution of climbing the rooftops of Stonetown's buildings, furtively taking photographs to make a visual record of what was happening in front of his camera lens. As well, any and all photographs of Zanzibar's Omani Sultanate presence were destroyed in an attempt to forget history, including its rich visual past, one full of images of dark and light, black and white, sky, water, and skin, and tropical island beauty, image, some of which the images I've showcased here, but produced largely at the expense of its African indigenous population. Well, we must keep in mind that for the majority of Zanzibaris, the revolution was a time of political lightness, the opening up of Zanzibar to its mainland hinterland connections, a return to its African roots, political power no longer held in the hands of a small aged Arab aging elite population, propped up by a sagging British colonial state, and where its own governmental structures of silent suffering and suspicion had also taken place. Once again, tropes of, dark, of darkness and lightness can be used to read this polarizing political moment to shed light on history in the making, the suppression of certain images and the production of new ones, alongside acts of visual remembering and forgetting. Meanwhile, Rahut took over the running of the studio nearly 20 years after the revolution in 1983, once Ranshad formally retired from the work of photography, living a full life with occasional visits to the studio now under the proud proprietorship of his son until his death in 1993. Rohit carries on his photo father's photographic practices, continuing to reprint and reproduce images made by his father of past light and dark-filled moments. 
During one of my visits, Brett had tells me the story of how his eldest brother had earlier moved to London in 1962 and had inadvertently taken many of their father's negatives and prints with him, which in light of the revolution were accidentally saved in the start of the cast collection. The same brother now maintains all the negatives there in cold storage and is the keeper of Ronchad's archive. I would argue that Rohit plays an equally important role as a keeper of his father's images, including their future other lives. Rohit himself has extended and created another distinct life for a certain set of his father's images, going so far as to retake certain images of the same street that his father photographed 50 years earlier, documenting his physical changes in the interim and selling both sets of off prints, a sort of before and after, to a newly arrived groups of visitors who stop in at Capital Art Studio as part of his position as a popular heritage, heritage and tourist destination. And this is something that my colleague Meg is really developing and writing about in more depth. Rohit also produces his own contemporary images of Zanzibar, including still taking portraits inside his studio. Um, also photos of bullfights on the nearby island of Pemba, a particular interest of his. Family weddings and special occasions, political rallies, and press photos for ZIF, which you know, many of you may know about, which is the popular annual Zanzibar International Film Festival that takes place every July in Stonetown. Returning to the idea of the physical darkroom, I would often ask Rohit where he prints his images now. It is a question that he evades answering. For even as he no longer uses the now defunct darkroom, he still produces prints from his father's negatives somewhere off site, a darkened place undisclosed to me despite numerous attempts to find out its precise location. As well, with a global turn to the digital, Rohit has followed suit for his own image making by a digital camera that he always carries with him. More generally, Rohit's photographs continue to reflect Zanzibar's Indian Ocean Island heritage with touristic images of sunsets, beaches, and local residents, while other photographs situate its much changed geography as integrated within Tanzania. He adds yet another layer to Zanzibar's photographic islandness, all the while gesturing to the other multiple lives of his father's images, unfurling much like a Dow's canvas sails during the monsoon winds into an unseeable future tense. I end this meditation on darkness with a photograph that I took inside Capital Art Studio on my last visit to Zanzibar in 2018. It is my photograph of a rare photograph of Ranshad Oza that Rohit shows me one day and that I decide to photograph for the purposes of my own image making. In looking at my final print and by fortuitous accident, I notice that both Rohit and I appear as faint presences in the lightened spaces of the photograph frame in the central figure of Ranshad Oza, a seemingly content middle-aged husband, father, and proprietor. The photograph works as a palimpsest, gesturing to Zanzibar's photographic islandness that I've written about and approached with the darkness. The accumulated layers of dismembered time from Rancha to Rohit through to myself, and finding the multiple other lives that all photographs have the potential to carry inside them. Thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay, there we go. All right, thanks. Uh, you should unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. there we go. So just a quick announcement that in the second half of this uh, event, we're going to gradually unmute and allow all the participants of this event to make themselves visible if they so choose. And you should uh, perhaps start using the raise hand function if you have any questions um, for our speaker and so that we can see all your happy Friday faces. Exactly, Friday evening for me. <laughs> so I think just to kind of get things started while you still process a little bit of all the richness of the stock, I just want to thank Pamela for such a very, very layered, right? Starting with your initial kind of um, thinking as an, an archeological mode. The talk itself is just so layered and palimpsestic but also very striking for me that it's a very deeply situated reading, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there's just many kind of layers of materiality and then thinking temporality within that. Um, one thing that was very, very striking to me was that once you open up an imagination for your listener and your reader of thinking of the site of the dark room, it becomes impossible to think about uh, what photography means outside of the dark room. So I think for me, what was very provocative and interesting, and it would be interesting to hear you say more about that, is this kind of classic discussion of photography as an indexical form, 
and for which we always think about what is photography's relation with the world. And you imagine the, 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 the camera always out in the world or in the studio. Mm -hmm. And now we are really thinking of the dark room as a site of production, where a different kind of sense of photographic meaning and the image is being produced, uh, which really compels us to think about where the affective meaning of, of, of images are produced, where these kinds of ideas uh, of blackness and various gradations of darkness are produced, and where is the labor that is, that is being done. So just that very kind of formative encounter of the camera and the world, you're just completely kind of displacing that site to this other site, which we do tend to forget, right? It's a kind of in-between site. So if you could just maybe tell us a little bit about what you think the thinking with the dark room also does for some of our kind of foundational um, theories of uh, the camera uh, and the photograph as an index. Okay, do you, do you want me to start with that one then? Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna keep an eye on people raising their hands, but in the okay. meantime, you're free to respond to any, any of any, any sure. of the comments. Sure. Okay, okay. Um, I'll go ahead and just start. That's, thank you, Devashri. That's a really profound question, actually, quite a difficult one. Um, I mean, I think it was just this idea of thinking through darkness that really opened it up for me. And I was trying to get my hook into what I wanted to be talking about. And again, it's these, you know, long hanging out with, with Rohithoza and his studio and him not letting us sort of go into the back that kept intriguing me. And so I kept thinking about what was happening in the back, you know, and during the 2015 visit, he finally allowed us very quickly into that back room, uh, which had its own other world. So it sort of started out from that idea of the back that I'd never got access to. Um, that opened it up for me. And then it was also the, really about sort of what was happening with African photography here in South Africa and people writing. And Candace Jensen is one of my PhD students who just finished a brilliant PhD last year. And she was presenting this paper on dark room girls. And I just, and I hadn't, and it just had to put it together as, as a way to think through this idea of the dark room. And then there was this conference. Again, I, I tried to sort of articulate how I came through it because it was really important for me that I went to this conference on darkness in, in the dark in January mm -hmm. in Svalbard. And it was quite an amazing experience to present your work in the dark um, on darkness, feeling darkness for five days. And so that really pushed it to another level of thinking mm -hmm. through darkness as, as a form of meditation. And I think that in itself, that experience of darkness really opened it up mm -hmm. to these other layers. So I'm, I'm glad that you, you kind of got those layers that I was trying to mm -hmm. sort of evoke invoke mm -hmm. and again the, the archive itself we've cataloged about 160 images in total so this is a very small portion and you know I'm I'm really for me this is an experiment in playing in the archive so I have another piece that's going to be published in around bicycles and the theme of bicycles in that in the archive and so again it's about what you can do with these older archives and really think anew about them so I'm hoping that's that answers your question a bit but mm -hmm. I, I feel like we're just tipping the iceberg with you know starting it, opening up these kinds of conversations. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think um, so Mana had your hand raised, but I also see Tejaswini Ganti. Mana, would you like to go first? Um, sure. I I, uh, I I just wanted to come back and um, ask a question that takes a kind of different set of things that you were discussing. Um, specifically, um, I'm interested in, um, so you talk about the, this islandness and you trace it over the lifetime of this father and son over the kind of across a divide of a revolution yeah and you you talk about the images of photo like the kind of history of photographing black skin and the use of light um in the context of what surrounds the island which is the sky and the water that refracts light in a particular way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you have this very important phrase which stuck out to me, which is the kind of effects, right? The technical, the photographic effects, and then affect. And then you started talking about the revolution and, and the kind of shift that it precipitated. And you were talking about the destruction of um, old images and the creation of new ones. And I was wondering if you could link um, that kind of uh, that that shift, the the kind of um, dismembering, um, attempting to remember, although it's maybe membering, <laughs> um, yes. and the forgetting, and then and how these images are working in terms of effect and affect mm -hmm. over this political moment. 
and transformation. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mana. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the revolution itself is just this topic now that finally historians are, are grappling with. And I think I mentioned this new book that just came out in 2019 um, by William Bissell, who's a well-known historian at Zanzibar, and Marie O'Day Fure Ray. I can never pronounce her name properly. Um, which is a really important book about those silences. And so they actually um, and the suffering and the different the complexities of who you were in identity politics. So I mean, again, for Rancho Adoza as a you know minority community member. Again, there was a huge community of Gujaratis, uh, Goans, and um, Parsis who were you know considered the sort of middle class of of Stonetown, and really were the merchants and traders in between the sort of British colonial state and the Omani Sultanate, and then the African population. You know, um, and so they were the brokers almost in some sense. So for them, as I as I talked about, they were, you know, they were not invested in this revolution taking place because their networks were via the Indian Ocean and they saw this moment as, you know, they were, most of them did leave, right? There's a very small population of, of Goans left um, and obviously Rohit's family stayed as well. Um, so this effect and I mean, the trauma he experienced when he describes to me or remembering his father burning everything in sight, um, as well as experiences of John da Silva who, who has passed now, but uh, at the time when I spoke to him, you know, the trauma of that moment for them uh, in experiencing this dismembering and this destruction of photographs it was a very traumatic experience for them. That then I haven't gotten enough on that other side of what, what happens, but I mean, public photography was banned, all the other studios closed. I mean, there was at least five or six at that time in functioning in Stonetown. So it was a very highly photographed city, uh, you know, strong middle class that would get their portraits done, you know, the selling of Christmas cards, you know, all that kind of stuff was happening. So it was really this moment of what I say is political darkness or photo visual darkness that that is temporary, but still it dismembers things in a certain kind of way. Um, when photographs do open up again, um, you know, again, I'm using the case of Ranchad and Rovidoza as managing that political transition as a quite a difficult one and being able to survive. Um, and to continue their tradition of taking photographs. So the, um, the effects and affects of it are very quite visceral, quite strong. And again, it depends on who you're talking to at what particular moment and how they experience that revolution. Um, I think I guess I'll just leave it there. because There's a lot more to say on that topic, but thank you for that great question. Thank you. We have quite a few questions now lined up. I'll okay. first invite Tejaswini Ganti to make her, her comment. My, oh, hi, thank you so much. That was a really fascinating talk. And I guess I just have a, a question more about the, um, the practice and process of photography itself, given the um, history that, of photography that we know about, especially the development of film stock, right? Which was really like when we look at the history of Kodak, I mean, it's really developed to kind of show white skin tones better, right? And that like um, black, black or darker skin tones were never uh, able to be exposed as well, right? I mean, all that history, that um, you know, that's been really nicely, um, um, you know, uh, kind of articulated. So I was wondering, in your research with these two photographers, was there any kind of discussion or um, kind of ideas about what one had to do, like it, like in terms of the actual, the processing, the exposing? Like, was there was there? Did you encounter like a discourse about the kind of, um, you know, the like the kind of maneuvering that one had to deal with the film, the physical film stock itself, given that you you, you talked about the kind of uh, discussions around black skin and everything. So I was just wondering if you could elaborate more. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, what's interesting is that when Rohit himself is quite a um, personality and he, he's talkative on some visits and other visits he was not. So he kind of had to just hang out and he would sort of reveal little snippets. So every once in a while he would make comments about um, the fact that he would fix some of his father's prints to make them look a little bit better, you know, things like that that would come into the conversation. Um, he never, he would sort of tell me how skilled his father was because he's, you know, everything's sort of in homage to his father as I think you got a sense from my paper. Um, so he would never criticize his father, but I think there were ways in which he would say that he was a really good printer himself, like, so that he would sort of, his way of making an argument that he knew what he was doing, you know? Um, unfortunately, you know, again, I never had technical conversations with him because he would never go there and I wanted him to. I and mean, again, I couldn't even find out where his actual dark room was. He was quite secretive around things like that. So, um, 
I mean, I think it's more as just his retelling of his father's story and these little bits about when the technology comes that we, you know, we've tried to glean, like, you know, when he got the, where you print things or, you know, his backdrops, all of that helped us frame this sort of narrative. And again, there's a lot of work coming out in South Africa and there's a colleague of mine, um, he's actually based in the States, um, Drew Thompson, who's working about sort of Polaroid company and, and the film stock and all of that and its circulations within that the larger sort of African context. So I think there's a lot more to be done on that topic that hasn't really been fully developed yet. So thank you. Okay, so we now have uh, Joseph Slaughter. Hi, Pamela, how are you doing? Hi, Joseph, nice to see you. It's Many great to see you. Um, so I wanted to come back to the, the sea and the water, um, mm -hmm. and the statements you said about the kind of reflection and the way that, that light works there and the island situation that Mana was talking mm -hmm. about. And um, I was thinking here in particular, I don't know how much the photographs you showed us are representative of the whole body of, of photographs, but I was really struck in those pictures with the, um, with the dows and the sea that yeah. the horizon wasn't the horizontal uh, mm -hmm. or was rarely the horizontal. Mm -hmm. So the horizon was almost always askew in some fashion and something else was chosen um, mm -hmm. to, for, the, for the orientation of the photograph. And yeah. it wasn't often a person, it was often something architectural or, you know, some other choice. And that, that, just, that choice obviously could have been made either at the time of the photograph or in the darkroom, right. right? In the, in the right. manipulation of the photograph in the darkroom. And I don't know if you had, again, I don't know if these were representative fully, but I don't know if you had any, if you had any thoughts about um, that or had thought about the, the question of the horizon in the, mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. photographs. Okay. Thank you, Joy, that's a great question. Um, yeah, it's so interesting because Meg and I always think of him as being quite architectural in his photographs, Um, So you're you're getting at that. I mean, these are quite representative of these images of the water because it's, it's again the ones I've pulled from our little collection we have. Um, that yeah, I've also because at one point I thought that there was sort of a middle line, and then I realized no, there's never an even between the sky and the water, and so that was really interesting. And I actually I'm glad you pointed that out because I think that's something could be developed a little bit more. Um, Meg actually is working a little bit more um, on some of the architectural elements. So I think that's something that um, I'll talk to her about and perhaps come back to you because I think that's an important aspect. And okay. just to add to that, a lot of it, I think there's a longer conversation to be had or, or written text around the lighting and the, the, and the time of day because a lot of his photographs are midday at, and he manages to still not get these washed out photographs which is quite interesting in itself so there's something about the lighting techniques that also needs to be perhaps elaborated on further thanks and i was also very struck by the one example you showed us of the use of superimposition so this perfectly framed kind of an image and then needing needing to fill in fill in the water with these dows. I mean, that's a very interesting kind of an, um, yeah. a, a creative choice. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a few more people already waiting. Usha, would you like to ask your question or would you like me to read it out? Okay, so uh, there was a comment from uh, Usha Ayer saying, thank you for a very rich and layered talk. In relating Zanzibar to the Caribbean through Thompson's work, and in mentioning Goa multiple times, your talk sparked for me questions about tropical blackness in particular, both the people who live in the tropics and the relationship of skin to the equatorial sun, but also the quality of darkness in light in the tropics, both of which form a particular relationship to photography. Could you speak about the tropics as a particular ecology that inflects our understanding of blackness and photography? Okay. Um, yeah, I think I'm sort of increasingly interested in this idea of the tropics and what that means and to bring these different places together in a conversation around the tropics. I don't really have a sustained answer to that question. I think it's just something really interesting and important to do to think, I mean, I, I mean, I know with Mana and Debashri, we're really thinking about oceanic imaginations. And I think it's important then to move beyond just the one ocean to think through these different oceanics um, and the ways in which we think about slavery in the Indian Ocean versus the Atlantic as being a very different kind of slavery. And I think there's something around the tropics that could be developed more. And there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, my first area of specialties in Goa, and there's a lot of arguments around the sort of tropics and the ways in which 
medicine works in the tropics that um, that go that brings go and Brazil into interesting conversations around that idea. And I think there's more to be said around this idea of blackness and tropics and lighting and the shine. And sh I mean, this is why Krista Thompson's work is so interesting. And I think there's almost a book to be made to thinking through her work in these other contexts. So thank you. Yeah. And if I could just uh, jump in there, I think from a film kind of studies perspective, there's a lot of work also being done on thinking the tropics, not just in terms of discourses about the light of the tropics, yeah. right? And, and also certain kinds of training manuals and so on that were circulating. Yeah. Um, also around colonial film units and mm -hmm. Brian Larkin is here and he could, he could speak to that about some of the special kinds of exigencies of filming yeah. in the tropics. This yeah. definitely have an effect on the photographer's uh, white body, uh, but also on the material substrate and the various conditions required in the dark room and in the processing laboratory with maintaining the temperature of the chemicals and so on. So I think yeah. just very, very uh, interesting ways to think uh, region, uh, climatological theory. Yeah, that's um, a really good point. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Shritama Chatterjee. Shritama, are you able to unmute yourself? Yes, I am. Thank you so much. Hello. Um, so, Professor Gupta, thank you for your talk. Um, this is a three-part question. Um, well, the first thing that I wanted to ask is that um, the role of weather, that um, the, the, the role that weather plays in understanding of photography and uh, darkroom photo photography and its conservation. Um, the second thing that I was really curious about was when you mentioned fieldwork and um, the practice of fieldwork and what it brings to understanding of photography and ecologies. And the third thing is actually more of a provocation, which is I, I know that you mentioned, um, you know, the, the existing body of scholarship on photography and psychoanalysis. But I was wondering what does Zanzibar and the local ecology sort of, you know, um, landscape of Zanzibar as well as the sea offer particular ways of reading this photography that might actually push back against the existing body of scholarship on psychoanalysis and photography. Yeah. Okay, okay. great, thank you. Um, three hard questions, thanks. Uh, weather, I mean, I think the extreme humidity of the, again, to go back to the tropics is a really important aspect of what the tropics do to, you know, paper, to the chemicals, to the darkroom itself, and always trying to keep it as a you know a dry space. Um, there's a lot more to be said then on the history of the of weather and how it's tied into particular you know the difficulties of taking photographs in a place like Zanzibar with that island humidity, that heat, that um, intensity of light. Um, so I think perhaps that's a, that's something that could be brought in more is the role of weather. And I think I've written a little bit in that Eyes Across the Water book about islandness. And so a lot of the stuff comes from this thinking through these layers of what makes an island an island. And weather, I think, is, is one of those important aspects. And of course, obviously, the monsoon and the ways in which the monsoons affect an island like Zanzibar. And, and life is tempered by the monsoons in a place like Zanzibar and a place like Goa. Um, so I think that's an important element to bring in. Um, yeah, this I just kind of threw in this idea of fieldwork as my own sort of dark room to the ethnography as a way to sort of provocate people to think through that if that's something that, you know, just to think through what does it mean that this, you know, it's this lab in some sorts to take, sift through all the, the ideas and text and interviews and conversations and feelings and moments to come up with this finalized. Um, so it's about the writing of ethnography um, as coming from field work as, as a form of dark room. Uh, yeah, this third point, I don't know if I can fully answer this, but photography and psychoanalytics. I think, I mean, I think here where, you know, I quoted um, Abdul Razak Gurna, um, I think some of his writings, cause he's written, uh, you know, a ton of novels around Zanzibar. And I think a lot of his work pushes against the psychoanalytics in some interesting way and gets at so almost, almost the affect and the effect in some ways that I think could, could be done, there could be more done with that to think through. And again, my colleague Meg, who's a literary scholar, um, has been writing a lot more through his, his, his writings to think through Zanzibar, so thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have someone who's been waiting a long time. Uh, Karen Pinto, are you able to unmute yourself? Yeah. There we go. I've unmuted myself. Well, I have to say that since I've been hearing these, there's even more ideas that are coming to the fore, like field room as a form of dark room. Um, but I'm also thinking again along the lines of some of the earlier questions, because I deal with Middle Eastern stuff. So I'm very interested actually in the um, 
19th century Iranian photographic tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and I started to wonder about the technology again, but not just the darkroom, the cameras. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in the Iranian case, they have some of the most amazing uh, glass negative prints. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, are they using medium format or what? Mm -hmm. um, just the technology side. And then the projection side, you know, these questions that you're raising about, um, I'm also very interested in, in uh, islands and, you know, issues that surround islands. Um, but this idea that somehow this is a projection of anxieties um, being from an island. I, I'm just wondering, you know, where you're going with that. I, I found that very fascinating. Love the pictures, by the way. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much to be, again, there's about 160 images that we've located as coming from Cass. And again, because of the revolution, you know, a lot of the actual negatives have been destroyed or they're with the brother who we also haven't been able to talk to who lives in London. Um, there's a lot, there's a whole series of postcards that uh, John De Silva, who is the going photographer who was taking photographs on the rooftops during the revolution, his family has a collection and he passed away in 2013. And so that the family, his daughter, we're in touch with and we're trying to get access to those postcards that he managed to collect from around the world um, after the revolution. So there's quite a collection there. And there's a lot of, so to talk, go back to technology and techniques, there's a lot of hand painted ones um, not only postcards, but portraits. There's, a, I mean, there's a beautiful collection around color that I haven't even begun to talk about. Um, and, you know, we, we troll the internet to see if those images pop up. The Northwest collection, um, collection in, the Winterton collection at Northwestern University has an, an amazing collection of some of the early going photographers as well as a few OZA images. Um, the, so the technologies, he did have a medium format camera. Um, Oza himself, but again, we don't know much about what images were taken with that. And we'd have to sift through more carefully some of them to see. Um, he was also borrowing cameras from other photographers. There was a whole gang of them he was friendly with. And so again, I think if the Sun were more willing to talk to us about all of these details, we would get more information. So, you know, I'm working with what I have and they're still, and it's an incredible archive. So um, I think this projection of anxieties is very interesting. So I wrote a piece uh, at the beginning of this where I kind of marked out the typologies of images. And so it was like Dow images, technologies like bicycles, cars, you know, and one was around British colonial officers. And I could see the anxiety very clearly in that set of images that I haven't written about. And I think that's, you're bringing up an important point that um, I think as this, again, this is tied into this minority community that were kind of allowed to live there, but then they also weren't part of the elite, weren't African, they were navigating their own positionality constantly. And so that anxiety comes through, I think, quite a bit in, in Ranchat's images. Thank you. Um, really, thank you everyone for your really fascinating, I think, questions and comments. And hopefully, Pamela, this is of some use to you as oh, you're developing this project. And very fascinating also for us to hear about all the other images in the collection, um, like the color images. That would really kind of change how we think about light and dark. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question now from uh, Brian Larkin. Brian, are you able to unmute? I am. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks. It's a great hi, talk. And it's, hi, how are you doing? It's a very rich talk as well, and um, it, it has me thinking of a lot of things. It will take me a while to think through. But I had one um, thing to think of from looking at similar studios in West Africa. And partly it was moving away from blackness and or darkness and lightness to grayness. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to the question of um, chemicals, which mm -hmm. are partly about climate, but they're partly, and, and I'm thinking now more West Africa, people using chemicals for too long. As with many technologies, they get used to excess, you know, beyond their own capacity, they get used beyond their, you know, performative lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. And they break down in various ways. So I remember, you know, some of the first studio photography that came became famous was Seydou Keita's and um, the work coming out of Mali. And if you look at the original images, they tended all to be very grey. And if you look at the images that then got to art galleries, they were crisply black and white. And that was because of the paper when Magnon reprinted them for the art world. It's because of the quality of the chemicals that were used. And I remember not picking up on this, but sort of always being slightly disappointed by the images I found in studios, which 
didn't seem to look like the images of the Seydou Keita books mm -hmm. that I had you know, seen previously. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering then how grayness may play out in your panoply. It sort of upsets the binary. It also seems to fit with your idea of the island interstitialness, also the going community of being somewhat in between these different things. And I wondered, uh, and then you could look at darkness as being produced twice, once in the taking of the image on the negative, which would be much more crispy, light, light and dark, and then reproduced in the dark room as that practice that you mentioned. Yeah. So I wondered, could grayness figure in as another factor into this equation that will allow you to do a certain sort of work? Um, yeah, thank you, Brian. That's really important, actually. Yeah, you know, I noticed, and I didn't, I only, it was sort of afterwards when I thought I should add more in, and a lot of those monsoon images are really gray. I don't know if you noticed, but they're very gray. Um, and that, you know, that uh, what Joey was mentioning with the off kilterness of the horizon, and they're very, just, they're muddy. They're a bit muddy. And I realized afterwards that I hadn't really talked through that. And I think I really like this idea because of the, it adds another interstitial layer because of the grayness of that community of Go and Gujarati photographers, as well as the grayness between. Um, and there could actually even be a section just on grayness. Um, yeah, I think, and again, this goes back to this question around um, what was happening in the, in the dark room as opposed to what was being printed. And I think this is where I have the suspicion that Ranchad's Ozas were quite, I mean, again, I think his negatives were very good, but he printed a lot of gray because he was, I mean, he had a hard time getting access to paper, to chemicals, all of this, this overuse, this poor quality, whereas Rohith is in a different historical period in time, even though he even has difficulty accessing paper, but he can print far better and sharper images. And I think um, he's very attuned to that, particularly because he's selling, I mean, he makes his living off selling these off prints of his father's. To, to customers coming in. I um, mean, it's also interesting, I think, to bring that grayness into the, I very quickly did the retake ones between the, you know, the 40 year span. And it's quite an amazing series that Meg is writing about these images of his father and his. And the way he's printing them would also be an interesting thing to think through grayness because I think he's, he's working through that himself. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, so next up we have uh, Karen Strassler. Hi, okay. Karen. Hi. Thank you, Pamela. That was wonderful. Um, so I, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is about the, the dark room. I mean, I'm just so intrigued by his reticence and his unwillingness to share that with you. And I'm curious what you make of that. And I mean, my immediate thought is that, um, you know, you, you brought out the dark room as a space of sociality and process and agency and all this work going on in there. Um, it's also a space of craft and skill. And um, I, I definitely found in my research that there was this kind of before and after um, around the um, automatic printing and, and color processing that where there was this sort of nostalgia and it, it was the same, it was familial, right? So it was, it was sons and daughters recounting their fathers. Um, and and so there was very much a sense of, of a loss and um, uh, that there had been this craft and there had, you know, now they're, they're all just technicians essentially. So I just wonder if you think that's where this sort of uh, refusal is coming from um, or whether there's something else going on that has to do with some kind of politics, um, you know, about where they're being printed or how they're being processed. I mean, maybe they're, I don't know, I'm thinking about in the Indonesian context, they're being sent to Jakarta, right? So they're not yeah. locally made anymore. And that's that's problematic when you're presenting yourself as a local, right? So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on what that's all about. Um, I have a second question, which is about that, those diptychs, um, the, the now and then pictures, and you mentioned that they're, they're mostly consumed by tourists. And I just wondered about the afterlives of these photographs for local people and and whether there is interest in them consumption of them people using them to um, display on in their homes or you know wh what the uptake to use uh, Ryan's term what the uptake is in their in their um, locally yeah okay thanks Sam. yeah I can kind of answer them together actually because there's a whole other world I've written a little bit about sort of 
thinking about Rohith more as a heritage maker and where his position is and sort of local heritage dynamics and politics within Zanzibar. But I think it's exactly that about his, his sort of hiding this craft and skill and wanting to retain that as his own sort of personal agentive moment in the dark room. So we had this really interesting moment where he finally agreed again in 2015, he let Meg and I go into the back room finally. And he said, I'll take a photo of you two and in the studio, right, with that backdrop. So he took a photo of us with his digital camera and then he said, come back in two days, right? And then he gave us the prints as in an envelope as if they, he had gone and, you know, processed them and developed them himself. So it was this moment of like, I'm still the skilled photographer who took these photographs, even though it was a digital camera, you know? And he made it into a studio moment in the way in which he put the digital camera on the on the tripod and set us up and you know and it's a beautiful image of, of the two of us that um so i think there's that i think there's a lot of secrecy around uh heritage politics in zanzibar in stonetown it's a very small place and a lot of his images have been used inappropriately or in ways that he wouldn't approve of and they've stolen photographs uh he's found he finds his father's Im uh, images in boutique hotels and he you know he goes and refuses, you know, to give them access. Someone ripped him off many years ago. So there's reticence, one, to trust foreigners, two, to even talk about where, because he doesn't want anyone to know, because he knows it's such a small little place. Um, so, I mean, his father's images are very, very valuable and, and you know, cons are consumed by, by people, you know, in Zanzibar, Zanzibar elites who live elsewhere. I mean, he's a well-known photographer and he's starting to get sort of a local local fame because a lot of people have been writing about him just recently you know so um he was quite reticent with us because we were academics and he didn't want to be sort of taken advantage of so he opened up to us again over these three visits um and he still doesn't trust i think he'd tell us more than he would tell local people because i already know some of the dynamics of it like another shop that sells prints from old studio photographs and he there that guy is always trying to get me implicated with him to get prints from Oza and that's like I'm not going there you know so there's a lot of internal dynamics and how you can get used within that context that he's he suffered from so so yeah yeah thank you I think there's one quick follow-up to that uh from Karen Pinto uh you're Karen. still muted Karen okay right yeah I just um just a couple of things you know that have emerged from these conversations so I spent a lot of time in dark rooms. I'm, I'm really into, I used to be anyway, really into developing film. And of course, that's the beauty of black and white, right? That you can manipulate it in a way that you can't quite as a photographer with color. Well, these yeah. days it's different with our cell phones, you know, and what we can do to editing pictures afterwards. Um, but I started to really think about, you know, manipulations, like maybe the same picture printed in different ways. I don't know if that's something you've seen. Uh, and then the other thing you were talking about, which was the addition of color and where the color, so the colors added to earlier pictures that were in black and white, right? And I'm just wondering if the addition of color and where the color is added, what that tells, um, tells you. Mm -hmm. Just thoughts that came up from all the dis excellent, fantastic yeah. discussion, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, the ones that are hand-tinted, um, that practice of sort of hand painting, um, are sort of more official royal photography. Um, so that would be an interesting thing to write through or develop further that I haven't myself. But a lot of those postcards have that kind of um, colored affect to them that are really beautiful. Um, and colors very muted, very sort of, um, aesthetically carefully done um, that I think, again, are its own genre in some ways. I don't think, so Ro uh, Rohith is very, uh, he's, again, he's very reluctant to tell me any of these things, but my sense is he doesn't really mess around that much with the images. Um, he likes to sort of, I think he thinks of himself as a bit of a purist and likes to take what his father took and not alter it that much and take what he, because his conversation about his father during superimpositions was a bit dismissive of his father for even going there. So I got the sense that he doesn't do much of that stuff himself, even though he does play around and he's a skilled photographer as well. So again, um, one of those areas that I think goes back to Karen's question as well as to what is his refusal or why is it that he doesn't want to engage on, on these sort of more, you know, 
technological questions around photography that we constantly ask him. Um, and maybe that maybe that'll happen on the next visit. Um, we sort of keep meaning we they end up being spaced three years apart, which is kind of an interesting um, dynamic in itself to see him over these years. Um, and he's opened up every time a little bit more. So so yeah, thank you. Uh, we now have a question from Jennifer Wenzel. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. <laughs> so nice Hi. to see you. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, thanks so much for this gorgeous talk. And, and I agree with everything that's been said about how um, palimpsestic and, and multi-layered it was. And, and another image that came to mind was multifaceted. So that each of your terms, I feel like you're kind of turning around to capture different aspects of it. And that was just really um, marvelous to see. And, and I, I, I don't have anything to add or ask about photography, which um, is kind of beyond my area of expertise. But I just wanted to make a suggestion about um, the Conrad um, with which you began. Sure. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm if you did this and I missed it, um, but I think it's it, it's worth like going back to the passage in Heart of Darkness about the map. Yeah. Um, because the terms of that I think are are so. Um, they're almost a kind of negative view of what we usually think of with regard to Conradian darkness. So um, I, I brought up the, the text um, and, and I'll just read a bit of it. Um, this is uh, uh, Marla reflecting on the map, right? So he says, uh, true by this time, it was not a blank space anymore. It had got filled since my boy boyhood with rivers and lakes and names. It had ceased to be a blank space of delightful mystery, a white patch for a boy to dream gloriously over. It had become a place of darkness. And I'm really struck by this, this moment in the novel of, of, of darkness as the inscription of European knowledge, as opposed to darkness as the European positing of lack. And I think that there's so much there that, I mean, not that you should write pages about it, but, but there's a lot there to think about the, the kind of um, uh, blankness and whiteness and darkness as, um, as in, in some ways, um, not analogous to, but but kind of resonant with uh, so much that you're doing about what lightness and darkness mean and what white and black mean with regard to all of the histories of photography, colonialism, et cetera, that you're unraveling. Um, yeah. So it's not a question, um, but uh, but just a suggestion for you. Thank you, Jennifer. That's great, because I, I, I totally should go back to that passage. That makes, yeah, I could add in a lot more using that. So thank you for mentioning that, pointing out to me. I'll take a look. Yeah, that really adds in actually another layer. So, and I didn't, I wanted to bring in the Conrad, but I knew I, I didn't, I, there needed to be more about Conrad and what point I was trying to make with that passage. So thanks, yeah. Um, if I could just ask another question. Um, and if, if folks still have more comments, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll come to you. I'm actually very curious about, um, about other kinds of photographic practice or other photo studios that you may have had a chance to kind of uh, look at from the 1930s, 60s kind of a period, just so that we can get a sense of if there was something very particular happening in, in terms of this is like a Ranchor Oza's kind of aesthetic vision or his mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, um, a kind of playing with chemical, with light, with composition that that seems different in some way. Or was yeah. there a kind of a larger conversation, visual conversation at this time across different media forms? Yeah, I, again, that's a great question. And this is where the problem where the revolution comes in because I would have wanted to do more work on these other going studios, um, mm -hmm. but because they all closed shop and they left Zanzibar, there's mm -hmm. not really much trace. So Meg actually went to, so Gomez had a had a branch of his. Um, this is a whole other sort of history of the going photographers in East Africa, because they started most of the studios in the mm -hmm. late um, 1800s, early 1900s, um, all across like Zanzibar, uh, Uganda, Kenya, all of them were started by Goen. So, Gomez had a studio in Kenya and realized how well he was doing. So he opened the one in Zanzibar, which makes it a very interesting, this twined thing. So Meg actually went to go do research on that studio. And then something uh, she got, she lost her passport, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, she was never able to do the research. Um, so we wanted to contextualize it within these other island sort of studios, but we haven't done that work yet. Um, but I think it's a really important point. And 
I think why we're trying to get this John De Silva collection from his daughter um, to look at sort of some of the postcards he's, he accessed. It doesn't give you the studios, but uh, I feel like there's still a way to, to do some of that work. Um, and we have to be more innovative in some ways to access these other studios and perhaps try and trace their families. Cause you know, a lot of the Goins and left for the UK or Australia um, that could be traced. Um, and there's a historian, uh, Margaret Friends, uh, German who's been working on sort of these studios. Uh, she's working on Goins, sort of global Goins is what she calls them, but she has a big book on this. That's a really informative book to, to think about where these families went, so yeah. I love the term island studios. And I really think that, um, I mean, a lot of this work is also work that will need collaboration. Like already mm -hmm. you and Meg working on this together, but this yeah. is not, I think a lot of the work that all of, a lot of us are involved in with thinking different oceanic histories. We really need, I think, to be able to have like networks to reach out to scholars elsewhere. Um, um, so I think, I think uh, that that is basically it. Mana, did you have a last question? Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, uh, kind of piggyback onto that. And an earlier thought I had, and at the beginning of the talk, I, I noted that the, the sort of studio shot in the background uh, that it has for the portraits, mm -hmm. um, that's something that I've seen and I've done, I mean, I have them in family photographs, but I also did a ton of archival research um, in the Bay of Bengal area around mm -hmm. the same time, 30s and 40s. And they all have this ba similar background yeah. of like yeah. the, the kind of neo-colonial pillar and, and it's the sepia look. And, and I guess the thing that I'm wondering um, in terms of how you're relating this is you, you, you've been talking about Islander and, and the concept specifically of an island, but how are we, and here I'm thinking about um, kind of broader Indian Ocean studies and stuff, how are we to compare um, something like that, like the ubiquity of a certain kind of photographic studio and the culture of portrait taking and photo taking. Um, how is an island uh, version of that different from a coastal version, right? And in here, I'm thinking about port cities that are located in places that are not islands. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, um, I mean, I think because I wanted to think through islandness, that was the approach I took. But I think Port City is also something that, I mean, that I would have a lot of these same commonalities. So you would have the Port City studio and the ways in which, you know, they were all ordering the same backdrops, exactly as you said, from two companies in the UK that, that, that would sending them off to these kinds of Port City places. Um, yeah, I took the island aspect just because I wanted to think through sort of islandness for Zanzibar and through light and dark. But I think there's another layer to the circulation that's happening because it's a port city um, that brings these other port cities into conversation, which again then would extend to looking at studios in these other kinds of port cities that um, I think had a lot. I mean, I, you know, I see ones from Durban and I also see very similar backdrops and I think there's a commonality there. Um, it's also this imperial connections, these, mm -hmm. uh, you know, these uh, Thomas Metcalf's work and thinking through, um, um, sorry, what does he call it, in, uh, imperial umbrellas and the ways in which, you know, the circuits were operating, even though you were, you know, horizontally, not just vertically between metropole and colony um, and that borrowing that was taking place. Um, so yeah, I think that's an important aspect to bring in, yeah. I mean, I think that's excellent because a lot of the studio backdrops and images of studio backdrops continue to circulate today in terms of postcards. And you also talk about how these studios were also producing and printing postcards that then had a very different kind of a circulation history. And I've seen very similar backdrops uh, with a very similar kind of an aesthetic um, and design vision from Bombay in the 1920s and 30s. Yeah. Right? So this is really a, a very, very interesting history of a kind of a movement of certain uh, aesthetic aspirations, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, I want to really just thank Pamela for also doing a lot of the work that Mana and I are really hoping that this project that we're starting this year, Oceanic Imaginations, will be able to do in terms of kickstarting a conversation. And I think one of the core things there, which really I think um, Pamela's talk really, really kind of developed so beautifully, um, is, is one of our impulses that how can we think with oceans, with islands, um, not just as metaphors but also in terms of their materiality. And I think Pamela, your talk really beautifully took us through this multifaceted, as Jennifer said, 
a view of thinking with certain words, but not just as metaphors, of course, is very important and useful conceptual um, frames, but also think of them as in their hapticity, in their viscerality, in their affective kind of burdens uh, and flights of imagination. So thank you so, so very much for this. Um, and uh, just a heads up to everyone that uh, we are now going to have another talk uh, in the spring. So it gives you a lot of time to recover from this uh, Zoom semester. Uh, and that talk will be by a Mauritian a British artist, Shiraz Beju. And uh, dates and times are forthcoming. And we also will have in the spring semester a small workshop uh, with various people that are thinking about oceanic histories, oceanic imaginations, circulation aesthetics from different disciplinary locations. So um, I hope to see many of you here again um, in the spring. Please join me in thanking Pamela with some loud applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, that was wonderful. That was really fun for me. So I really got some wonderful comments, feedback that I feel like I could take to another level. And I think then your next, you should, someone who works on these backdrops, I think would be really important. So I think bringing in the dark room is, is one aspect and another thing would be to bring, because I, I really can't think of anyone who's working on these backdrops. And I think it's a really important point that's, that's come out of this conversation. So thank you all again. And it's my Friday evening here. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to go. Um, thank you. <laughs> really enjoyed that. Bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Pamela. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you guys. That was great.